Did you know that 95% of cyber attacks rely on social engineering? And did you know that humans are the weakest link in the security chain? Welcome to the course. We're going to discuss some interesting topics. We're going to start off with smishing, which is a popular text-based social engineering attack and which has been successfully used by attackers around the world to infiltrate mobile devices and get people's personal information as well as their credentials. Next, we're going to discuss phishing, which is your traditional social engineering via emails. We're also going to discuss what are some of the red flags that you should look out for and how you can protect yourself against phishing attacks. Next, we're going to discuss secure data disposal techniques. So before you discard or sell off your hard disk drives, laptops or cell phones, there are some precautions which you must take. And just because we delete or format these devices doesn't mean that data cannot be recovered because it can easily be recovered using advanced forensic tools. So we're going to share some tips which you should keep in mind before going ahead with disposing these devices. Next, we are going to discuss how you can stay safe and secure online and how do malicious websites inject malware onto your browsers or even onto your systems. We are also going to discuss attacks such as cross-site scripting and what are some of the precautions that you should take. In this course, we also have a small practice activity to give you a bit of hands-on experience as well as a quiz. Hello, my name is Dr. Usman. I have a PhD in Computer Sciences and I've been working in the industry for more than 10 years in different roles, including Senior Cybersecurity Consultant, Senior Software Engineer. I am also CISSP Certified, which is the Premium Certification in Cybersecurity, and I also hold a number of AWS certifications. So once again, a very warm welcome to the course. Hello and welcome to Smishing, a new type of a social engineering attack that has been widely used by attackers around the world to get people to reveal their confidential and sensitive information. So let's see how it works. So the basic idea of Smishing is that it's social engineering via text messages. So you know, you could receive a message like, for example, congratulations, you have won a Amazon gift card or you've won a free bonus, you may have won uh, free delivery of some you know interesting item and the basic idea is that they want the user to click on the link that is included in the text message now why do they want to do this they want to do this in order to achieve a certain objective let's see what are the different steps in a smishing attack right so the first step is obviously it's the bait it's the phishing text that you received on your mobile phone the next step is that the victim considering that they've actually won something or, you know, they actually want to get a bonus or, you know, a great deal which is being offered, they click the link. So either it's maybe clicking a link or it could also be the SMS could be asking the end user to respond with some information in order to carry forward the communication. So once you click that link, that link takes you to a malicious website, which basically installs malware on your mobile phone or whatever device you're using, or in addition to that, it can also, you know, extract sensitive information from that session. And the last step is that once your device or your account has been infected, the attackers basically want to exfiltrate data or your confidential information, for example, your passwords, your bank account information, your social security numbers, whatever they can get their hands on. And all of this is done through the malware or the malicious application that has been installed on your mobile phone. Uh, as a consequence of following this link. So it's you have to be pretty careful with these type of attacks. Now, obviously the basic idea is that it's text-based phishing, but the interesting point is that in general, smishing is much more successful uh, than their traditional counterpart, which is uh, phishing through emails. And the reason is because a lot of the time people give more importance and more credibility to whatever they receive on a text versus what they receive in emails. Because, you know, we've been receiving spam and junk emails and all kinds of scams uh, for a long time now on emails, right? So we are all sort of familiar with, you know, um, at least most of the scams. But when we receive a message on our mobile phones, it, it, it doesn't, you know, uh, sort of clicks immediately because it is something relatively new. So that's why these type of attacks are a bit more successful. 
Moreover, mobile devices have generally less security measures compared to, you know, your laptops or desktops with all the, you know, anti-malware, anti-viruses, firewalls and everything. So that's why mobile devices by definition are generally a bit more trusting. Another important point is that attackers can sometimes spoof the, you know, number from which the message is being sent. So if you check the number, it may appear to actually come from that organization, you know, from maybe Amazon, FedEx, whatever. This lends Im immense credibility to the message and it's pretty hard for a, you know, normal end user to actually identify whether this is a smishing attack or not. We're going to share some tips later on in the lecture, which is going to help you do just that. Now let's look at some of the main objectives of smishing attacks. So one of the objectives could be to get your information, for example, to get your usernames, your passwords or your account information, which the attackers can subsequently use to, you know, extract information or, you know, get financial benefits out of. It could also be, you know, that smishing message could entice you to download or install uh, an application which appears to be something very useful. You know, it may be, for example, from your bank uh, asking you to install a new version, a different version of their, uh, you know, bank application or, you know, it could be anything which entices the user to install it. Now, that application could be malicious. And, you know, once you install that uh, application on your mobile phone, that application gets a lot of access. You remember whenever you install any application, you have to sort of agree to a long list of things which the application can do. And, you know, we don't actually go through the fine print and we just accept. So if the application is malicious, it can actually go ahead and get a lot of information out of your mobile phone and send it remotely to the attackers. The third objective could be to scam the users. Now, in this case, they don't include any link or anything, but they may try to engage with you in a communication with the hopes of, you know, later on using social engineering to trick you into revealing your confidential information. Let's have a look at some of the popular smishing attacks. So there was one uh, which was early access Apple iPhone 12 scam happened in 2020. And basically the SMS enticed people to provide their credit card information for a free iPhone 12. Now, a lot of people are obviously interested in getting the latest version of iPhone as soon as possible. So that was something they were sort of, you know, banking on. Now, there was a URL in that message which took people to a chatbot which looked like to be the one from Apple. And, you know, they said while the iPhone 12 is free, you know, as part of a scheme, you have been selected as a, you know, small group of people to which iPhone would be provided. But they did say that, you know, uh, in order to cover the shipping cost, which is just a small amount, you need to provide your credit card information. And that's how they were able to get a lot of credit cards from people. And obviously, then they used them to you know, uh, get a lot of money, do a lot of shopping. Another popular attack was the FedEx smishing scam. Now, FedEx is one of the largest logistics company in the world. So the SMS claimed to be from FedEx uh, and informing the person about a pending delivery. And it included a link to update the delivery preference, you know, whether you want the package to be left at your doorstep if you're not there or are you going to collect it from a local office. But what the link actually did was to take you to a malicious website, which would then install, you know, malware on your mobile phone. And from then on, you know, they were able to infiltrate people's mobile phones and systems and get a lot of data and sensitive information out. Now, we discussed, you know, what are some of the possible smishing attacks? How do they work? Now, how to be safe? Let's share some tips on that. Now, the first point is that obviously you need to be aware that these type of attacks do exist. And, you know, if you are, have a bit of an idea of what a typical uh, SMS looks like in case of smishing attacks, which we just saw. And, you know, it's always recommended never to click links in a suspicious SMS. Uh, and, you know, even if it's a legitimate SMS, you have to be very careful. And... More importantly, you should never divulge sensitive information, no matter how urgent. So please remember that your bank or any financial institution or anyone, they'll never ask you to actually, you know, uh, share any secret passwords or PIN numbers or anything through SMS or emails, right? And, you know, the best safety tip, you know, uh, 
if you're not sure whether it's a smishing uh, attack or not, you know, if in doubt, just, you know, don't respond to the SMS and just find out the official helpline number to your bank, to FedEx, wherever it's claiming to come from, and just give them a call. So this way, you're 100% sure that you're actually in contact with the right people. Okay, so with that, we conclude our lecture. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome to the practice activity on smishing. Let's see if you can identify the red flags and spot a smishing attack. Now you have two messages, A and B. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. Please go over both of them and identify which one is a legit message and which one is a smishing attack. Now, in this instance, B is a smishing attack because no bank in the world is going to ask you for your PIN number uh, on a message or even on a phone call, right? So this is confidential information which banks would never ask you to divulge. On the other hand, message A seems to be legit because it's just a reminder and it's not asking you to click on any link. And in fact, it's asking you to either log in to the account or even call the official helpline. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the lecture on online security. So when we browse the internet, a lot of times there are untrusted or unsafe websites which can basically install malware payloads onto our browsers and from there on onto our systems. So, you know, we have to be very careful as to what types of links we click, what are the types of websites that we're visiting, and where are we downloading the software from. So, in this lecture, we're going to explore all these kinds of issues and what are some of the security tips that you can take. So, the basic idea is that, you know, as an end user, one fine day, you fire up your laptop, you open your browser, and, you know, you visit an untrusted website. Now, why would you visit an unsafe website? Well, there could be a couple of reasons. One could be you may have received a phishing email which included a link to this malicious domain. And you know, it enticed you to click on it by promising maybe a reward, a prize, a bonus or anything, right? Another option could be, you know, you may have found this link maybe browsing on any discussion forum or other websites. And you know, at the end of the day, you basically land on this website. Now, the problem with these type of websites is that they have these uh, malwares, which are basically scripts. And since your browser is supposed to run JavaScript, uh, so they sort of leverage this issue and they try to install malware, malware onto your browser and from there on onto your systems, right? A lot of times this malware can also come as browser extensions. So browser extensions are small pieces of, you know, so software which get installed into your browser and they facilitate things like, for example, you may have a plugin to convert, for example, any file to PDF or, you know, download videos, those kind of things. But those are the ones that you have purposely installed, right? In this case, the malware can get installed silently as a browser extension or in any other form without your knowledge, okay? So as a result, you know, this malware infiltrates your system and then, you know, you'll have all sorts of issues. Interestingly, as an example, in 2020, Microsoft investigated the Atrozec drive-by download campaign, which basically infected uh, Chrome, Edge, and Firefox browsers. So they carried out an investigation over four months, and here are some of the you know worrying facts that they found out. They identified 159 unique domains, which were continually distributing hundreds of thousands of malware samples. Now, please understand 159 unique domains, not websites, right? For example, one of these domains, the so domain is, for example, you know, dot um, Amazon.com, for example, this is one domain, right? You could have uh, hundreds of thousands of email addresses or, you know, URLs or subdomains within this domain, right? Now, in this instance, they found out one of the domain hosted at least 250,000 different URLs, so 250,000 different websites, while the, one of the other, you know, domain, it hosted 100,000 um, 100, URLs. So you can imagine the number of unsafe websites which were actively installing malware, 
more over it was also a bit dangerous because you know these websites weren't static so basically some would come up go live and then you know uh, turn off in within 24 hours other would stay there for months so it was a very elaborate scam and they were able to infect a lot of computers around the world okay so this is just to give you an idea the amount of drive by downloads that's currently happening on the internet another very interesting um, and a sort of dangerous attack which is done is the cross site scripting attack it's also a sort of variation of the drive by download but here is how it actually works so say you are on a discussion forum and you know um, someone has a genuine user a legitimate user has posted a thread now what the perpetrators would do is that they're going to just add you know a response to this thread or maybe create another thread and they're going to submit the text of the thread which actually contains some malicious script so instead of you know your standard text like the first user had done you know hello this thread shares recipes for apple pie etc now the malicious attacker may include some actual javascript here right so the problem with this is that you know the next time if you visit if anyone visits this page or you know views this thread what happens is that this code would automatically get executed and it's going to do a couple of actions without you you know being even aware of it so in this case for example the malicious script can get loaded onto your browser and you know it could steal session data now keep in mind you know when you for example sign in to let's say gmail right you don't have to keep on signing in again or for example if you sign into amazon.com your account you don't have to sign in again and again while doing searches or you know doing other stuff the reason for this is because the browser stores this sort of your credentials in a session right so that you don't have to do it again and again it also uses the concept of cookies for other purposes but generally speaking there is some sort of data uh, within your browser uh, within your browser session which is used to sort of store your credentials so that you don't have to log in again and again so these kind of scripts can at the least you know store that data so they can get access to your passwords usernames and all kinds of stuff let's have a look at what are some of the precautions that you can take to avoid these kind of issues well the first step is that you should always make sure that the website that you're visiting is using HTTPS and not HTTP so you know if you see the URL for any website you should always have this S and if there is an S you would also see this lock icon okay so it's very important that whenever you visit a website it is a secure website and you're using HTTPS which basically means that whatever data is sent from your browser to that website is encrypted so you you know uh, hackers cannot simply eavesdrop on it so this is the first good step in fact you know if you uh, google and other search engines they don't even let http websites you know show up in their results the second point is that you should always keep your operating systems and browsers updated you know and when we talk about browsers you know um, or operating system two things which are very important to keep updated are you know java and you know the flash versions because a lot of times uh, these two are exploited extensively uh, by malware you should always use and keep your anti malware uh, you know anti virus software updated this is also pretty important because you know viruses are always evolving they have you know new methods of attack and you know malware companies they maintain these updated databases of the new fingerprints of how you know new viruses are working so you should always you know sort of remember to update and you know your malware software but most importantly i would say it's about using common sense so for example if you see any suspicious extensions in your browser you should disable them in fact you should you know avoid using extensions unless you're very sure of you know the authenticity of a particular browser extension you should never click on you know untrusted links you should never you know try to download softwares off unsafe websites you, if you want to download a software you should always go to the official site of that you know company so these are some of the precautions which you can take to significantly enhance your online security posture with that we conclude our lecture i'll see you in the next one hello and welcome to the lecture on phishing 
So phishing is one of the most widely used social engineering attacks around the world. And it's widely used by hackers to infiltrate organizations and in order to trick people into divulging their confidential or sensitive information. So let's see how phishing actually works and what are some of the precautions or safety tips that you can follow. So basically, let's say one fine day you receive an email in your inbox, uh, which says that your invoice from Amazon. Let's have a look at this email. So this email uh, says that it's from Amazon and it contains an invoice and it says, Dear customer, please find attached the invoice for your recent purchases from Amazon. We thank you for shopping with us and looking forward to see you again. Now, a lot of the times, you know, when we see these emails, we don't have, you know, per email, we spend roughly, say, 10 to 15 seconds and we have to make a decision and action it, right? So a lot of the times when we see this Amazon logo and, you know, even if we haven't ordered anything uh, out of curiosity, you know, we want to open this attachment. And as soon as we open it, actually, there is a malware uh, inside this attachment, which basically infiltrates your system. Now, usually these type of attacks, they don't masquerade or hide a big uh, code of malware or a big piece of malware within files or links because it's uh, a bit difficult to get it through under the radar. So they use these sort of droppers like tiny malware. And the first thing this malware does after, you know, entering your system is to open a backdoor. Now, see, um, the way that, you know, c computers, laptops, they work is that they, they have these sockets or ports through which a network communication occurs. And every system has uh, roughly 65,000 ports. Most of these ports are blocked by the operating system, except for the ones which are currently being used, for example, by your browser to access the Internet or maybe other applications. Right now, what this malware does is that it opens one of these ports silently and it contacts a remote attacker. And it also allows that remote hacker to basically send more advanced and more, you know, bulky payloads, which can do a lot more damage. Now, what this does is that uh, this detailed malware, this new piece of malware, which gets further installed on your system, it provides hackers a lot of access on your system. They can remotely access all your files, your confidential information. They can see the applications running. They can even, you know, uh, exfiltrate a lot of your data and files and which they actually do. And the interesting thing is that a lot of the time we are not even aware of this uh, data breach, you know. Another important point to keep in mind is that if you're working in a corporate environment, a lot of your, the times your system would be part of a big network. And once the malware has infiltrated your system, it can then literally spread out to other systems and servers within your corporate network. And this is how basically attackers are able to infiltrate organization. It just takes one mistake by one employee, you know, who clicks on a malicious link or opens a malicious attachment. And then the malware basically infects his system and then it can spread laterally to different parts of the organization. So it's something very serious. Now let's have a closer look at this email. So research says that on average, a user spends roughly 15 seconds into skimming through an email before making a decision about it. So we don't have a lot of time, but it's always, you know, useful to be on the lookout for some big red flags if you can identify them. Right. So let's have a detailed look at this email. Now, the first thing that you should always keep in mind is that ignore whatever it says here, you know, where it's from. You have to look at the actual email. So if it's an email, you can expand the header and see the actual sender's email, which in this case has got nothing to do with Amazon, right? Now, if it was a legitimate email, it should have been coming from at the rate amazon.com. So that's the first red flag. Moreover, if you have a detailed, you know, a closer look at the email, you're going to find a lot of grammatical and spelling mistake. For example, purchases, uh, there are two full stops. And, you know, we thank you for the shopping with us. Now, it's not a rule, you know, every phishing email won't have uh, grammatical or spelling mistakes, but generally they do. And it's always good to be on the lookout for them. Moreover, you know, it's always important to keep in mind that, you know, whatever action you take as part of an organization, it may have, you know, uh, consequences for your organization. So it's always nice to be careful. Now, let's have a discussion on some of the safety tips and precautions that you can take. Uh, so that, you know, you don't become a victim of phishing scams, right? The first thing is to be always, you know, watch out for red flags in your emails. You should always verify the sender, expand the email header, see if it's the actual sender, which they claim to be. 
uh, look out for mistakes in the email text and if there are links within the email asking you to click on them uh, you know before clicking them just hover your mouse over them and you'll be able to see what's the actual link uh, you know what would be actioned actually where would you actually be taken Another important thing that you can do is that you should always be wary of prizes, free gifts and bonuses and phishing attacks are particularly common during holiday seasons, for example during Christmas, Easter holidays. In a previous role as a senior cybersecurity consultant, we used to run these in-house phishing campaigns, sort of like white hat phishing campaigns, uh, you know, with the knowledge of IT security and upper management. Uh, we used to run them near Christmas and we used to craft these emails, you know, informing employees that, you know, as Christmas, uh, they're going to receive a bonus from the company, you know, they should click on this link to claim it. And once, you know, whoever did that, we obviously followed up with them and coached them not to do this. But one of the most important things that you can do, and you know, as end users, um, a lot of the time it's very difficult for you to vet uh, email properly and identify whether it's an actual phishing email or it just looks to be one. Now, if you have any doubt, simply report that email to IT security who are, you know, equipped with the necessary skills and they have the forensic tools to carry out an investigation and find out whether if it's an actual phishing email. This is also very important because you may not have clicked on that malicious link or downloaded that malicious attachment, but there may be other employees in your organization who have done so. So if you report it, it would be, you know, easier for IT security to follow that up. So in conclusion, phishing attacks are, you know, one of the most dangerous types of social engineering attacks. They're very common. Uh, and, you know, these are some of the safety tips that you should take in order to protect yourself and your organization. So with that, we conclude our lecture. I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome to the lecture on typo squatting. So it's an interesting variation of a social engineering attack, which basically exploits the fact that, you know, people make mistakes when they type URLs. Now, this type of attack has become very popular during recent years. It's very difficult to detect this kind of attacks. And moreover, it's also a bit difficult to evade these type of attacks. Now, let's see what is type of squatting is and how you can protect yourself as, as well as your organization. Now, type of squatting basically exploits, you know, common type of mistakes, which people make when they type URLs. Now, as humans, sometimes we make mistakes when we type, you know, a, a website name or a domain name. And what actually happens is that there are some malicious people out there who have actually gone ahead and bought those domains and hosted malicious websites on those URLs, which are just small variations of the actual URL. And those sites actually have malware. They can install malware on your systems or they can even try to trick you and get information out of you. So for instance, if you look at amazon.com, right, you may have missed an A here and, you know, instead of amazon.com, so you'll end up at amzon.com. Another variation could be, you know, if you miss E in LinkedIn. Similarly, you know, you could also type an extra O. Now, usually, you know, with these tech giants like Amazon, LinkedIn and Facebook, what they usually do is that, you know, they try to buy a lot of the basic variations of their names. So, for example, it's very likely that amzon.com may have been bought by amazon.com. And if a user accidentally, you know, visits this, it simply redirects, uh, you know, the user to the correct website. However, it's obviously not possible to imagine, you know, all of the combinations that you can do. For example, you know, someone may type a here, amazan.com, someone may, you know, omit another letter. So there are just so many combinations, you know, despite having deep pockets, you know, even these companies, they cannot buy all of the, you know, possible mistakes. Now, the thing is that, you know, when these malicious actors, they host these malicious domains or websites um, on a simple variation of the actual name, they make that website look very similar to the actual deal. So, for example, uh, if this was a malicious website uh, and if you visit it, it's very likely that it would have similar logos to Amazon. It may even ask you to you know, log into your account and then capture your credentials. So this is how it works. And despite having a lot of resources, it's actually pretty difficult to get rid of this stuff. Now, there are certain things, you know, which can make typo squatting easy or difficult, right? So let's look at those. 
So the first thing is that, you know, if you have difficult domain names, then it obviously open up, opens up opportunities for exploitation. You know, because as humans, for us, it's a bit difficult to remember long names. So if you have a website name like shopserendipity.com, what is the likelihood that, you know, everyone is going to type it correctly? It, so there's a good chance that, you know, a lot of people are going to make mistakes. And that's why it's usually not recommended to have complex domain names because, you know, it's just asking for trouble. Another example could be uh, reconnaissance.com. Now, reconnaissance is a French word which basically stands for doing a sort of spying and gathering information about a certain place or area while being safe. Now, obviously, these kind of domains are really difficult to type and how many of us would miss an n here or an s here or you know there are just so many ways this could go wrong so it's a good idea to avoid complex domain names um, and generally you know websites which have very complex names are generally not considered as a good practice another variation could be if your domain has hyphens in it right so hyphen is the only thing that is allowed, you know, it's the only special character which you can use in domains, generally speaking. So if you have good ed, good-education.com, someone may type goodeducation.com or bitcoin-discussion-forum. So someone may, you know, skip this hyphen or they may type bitcoin-discussion-forum or they may skip this hyphen, you know, they may type bitcoin-discussionforum.com. So you see the pattern, right? So if you have a complex domain name or a domain name with hyphens, you're basically asking for trouble because a lot of your end users are going to end up on, you know, um, domains which are not the real deal. Also, sometimes this technique is actually used by malicious actors. So for example, there may very well be a legitimate website, goodeducation.com, but attackers, they may buy a different domain and they just put this hyphen in between and at first look, this looks to be the correct URL, good-education.com. So these type of things should generally be avoided. And, you know, we should be careful, especially if we are going to uh, uh, typing up a complex domain name or a domain with hyphens. Now, a very interesting domain which has existed for quite a while now is google.com. Obviously, they're banking on the fact that Google, one of the most popular search engines on planet, and there are literally millions of people typing google.com uh, into their browsers every second, right? Now, obviously, you know, even if a tiny percentage of those people, they make a mistake and they type google.com. So basically, they would land on this malicious website, which has been there for quite a few years. Now, initially, this was a malicious domain, which injected viruses and malware. And one of their ways of uh, attacking was that basically you had pop-ups which exploited a vulnerability. And it claimed that your system has viruses and if you install this antivirus software, Spy Sheriff, then it would get rid of all of the problems. Obviously, it was a uh, bait and basically Spy Sheriff was actually a malware uh, which would exfiltrate a lot of information out of user system to a remote server. And it was actually pretty bad. More recently, they've sort of changed their modus operandi. Instead of trying to install Spy Sheriff, what they now do is that they try to leverage social engineering techniques. And they show that it's sort of a US presidential survey website. Uh, so they would ask you for your name, um, postal address, email address, and then obviously your opinion, for example, who's going to win the next pres presidential election and so on. And then obviously they misuse that information which people provide. But Google, one of the biggest tech giants in the world, even they could probably not stop this. And the reason is very simple actually, because you know, domain registration, once someone has registered a domain, it's very difficult to get it from them. And a lot of people around the world, what they do is that they buy these small variations, possible mistakes uh, of, you know, website names, and then they get them registered. And then either they misuse it or they ask the actual company to pay a lot of money for that domain. And even if they don't want to sell, actually, no one can force them. They if they keep on renewing it, well, they can still use it. And this has been there for quite a while now. 
Another very interesting attack which actually has affected quite a few people around the world is the HP printer scam. And the way this works is this. So one fine day someone goes and buys an HP printer and when you know they come back and they try to set it up and install it, they open the user manual and the user manual says that you need to visit this URL to download the drivers, right? Now it's not a simple URL, it's slightly complex and there's a good chance that people make mistakes. And there are known websites with variations of this URL which are malicious and which are set up to look just like official HP printers, uh, HP's website. They even have printers and you know other stuff on it. And the way this scam works is that, so that user, when they think that it's the official, they have actually typed the correct URL and they are on the official HP website. There is actually a, so when the users visit this website, what happens is that there is a pop-up and there's a so-called tech person from HP and they say that, okay, we're going to help you set up your computer. And then either, you know, they sometimes ask for remote access to, you know, people's systems. And there are softwares which allow that. And they say that there is a problem setting up the printer on your computer because um, there's a virus in your computer. So the printer cannot be set up. However, you know, they are very nice, you know, between inverted commas. And they say that they'll repair and remove the virus and set up the printer and fix everything for maybe 99 or $199. And there are quite a few people who fall for this scam because, you know, in their minds, they are actually talking to an HP representative, right? And to be honest, sometimes you know, the end users cannot be blamed because, you know, to be honest, this is not a simple URL, 123.hp.com slash nv4510. There is a possibility of people making mistakes and there is a well-known website which actually exploits this fact. Let's have a discussion on, you know, what you can do in order to protect yourself. Now, the first tip is obviously to be very careful when you're typing URLs. For example, you're um, you know looking at a URL on some printed piece of paper and then trying to type it as opposed to copying it from some online source and just pasting it. Another important indication is that usually typo squatting websites have ads and pop-ups. Now, official websites also have ads uh, you know, but they are sort of like blended in with the background, not like on in your face sort of ads, but usually these malicious web domains or websites, they have these a lot of ads and they have pop ups with, you know, tech people trying to sort of help you. So that's also a, an indication, you know, something may be wrong. Another, you know, a telltale sign is that either the website or, you know, the so-called tech staff would uh, so try to get personal information from you, maybe your uh, social security number or your postal address, your name or phone number or anything. And at some point in time, they would want some sort of payment for, you know, some service that they provide. This is also another telltale sign. Another thing which you can do and uh, look out for is that a lot of these typo squatting websites do not, do not have certificates installed on them. So they do not use HTTPS. So for example, you won't be seeing this uh, sort of, you know, this S after HTTP and you won't be seeing this lock icon. So if you visit a website which doesn't show this and usually, you know, your browser is going to show a warning somewhere here, then that's a good indication that it may be a, you know, a bad website or an unsafe website. Finally, the best tip is that if you are in doubt, just call the official helpline and then the IT support staff, they may be able to send through a link on your email or you, you may ask them about any things that are you're seeing on their website, which you find out of the ordinary. But that's, you know, your should be your source of truth. So with that, we conclude our lecture. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the lecture on secure data disposal. So the basic idea that we're going to discuss in this lecture is data remnants. So data remnants is when you have data that still remains on these devices, even after you've attempted to delete it or format these devices. Now we often sell off hard disk drives or, you know, discard them or dispose of them. And, you know, we consider that once we have deleted or formatted data, it's no longer there. 
However, using advanced forensic tools, it's very much possible to discover tons of information from your hard disks. And there are certain things that you should keep in mind before, you know, selling off or disposing these kind of devices. We're also going to share some tips that you can, you know, uh, steps that you can follow in order to make sure that there is minimal probability of your personal or confidential data being recovered. Now, there are four different aspects that we are going to discuss. The first is, you know, related to hard disks. Now, hard disks contain a wealth of sensitive information. And, you know, if you don't take appropriate sanitization steps, then, you know, people are able to recover tons of information using advanced forensic tools. Cell phones are also a very popular commodity, which people often buy and sell. And, you know, they are particularly important because they contain personal pictures, videos, personal contacts, as well as chat histories. And there have been numerous incidents in which people were able to recover these kinds of information from used cell phones that they bought. Now, simply crumpling up documents or tearing them and throwing them in the waste basket is often not enough. So there are certain things that you can do. For instance, you can shred the document before discarding them. However, you know, even if you have shredded a document, but you are discarding all of those fragments at one place, it can still pose certain dangers because there have been instances in which people are able to, you know, sort of put back all those shreds and recover the original document. Flash drives are something which we often use, you know, to move data, copy data from one system to another. And then, you know, we just forget about what do they contain and they're just lying around until we lose them one day without even realizing what do they contain. So data remnants is a serious issue and you know whenever you want to dispose of or sell off these type of personal assets or storage devices there are certain precautions that you should definitely take now technically speaking data remnants is the concept that there is residual data on these devices even after you've attempted to remove it now simply deleting files or even formatting often does not completely remove the data Let's take the example of a hard disk, right? Now, let's say this is a hard disk drive. And, you know, the way hard disk drives store data is that these, they have these special sort of lookup tables called file allocation tables or file tables simply. And the way that they store data is that whenever you have a file, for example, we have a movie, this table is going to note down its name, its type, for example, and it's also going to note down at which cluster and which sectors within those clusters is this file located. And another thing which this table does is that it marks these clusters and sectors as being unavailable and, and you know, as being occupied. Obviously, you can have other types of, um, you know, files as well. Now, when you go ahead and delete these files or even do a quick format, it doesn't actually delete these files. The only thing it does is that uh, the operating system goes in this file allocation table and marks these locations as available without actually deleting these files from the hard disk. Now, the problem is that, you know, um, from the point of view of a user, these files are gone because, you know, the file allocation table says these sectors are available. And if you do a lookup of these files, these are not available. However, in reality, these files are very much present on the hard disk drive and using advanced forensic tools, it's very easy to recover these. So, for example, if you store a new file at this location, for example, uh, you know, you may have a file which sort of overlaps with some of these locations, but some part of this uh, movie or, you know, documents or information may still be there, which is actually pretty easy to recover. Now, Computing Magazine uh, recovered around 22,000 deleted files, so-called deleted files from eight computers, which it bought from eBay. Now, eBay is a popular uh, website on which people often sell used hard disks, laptops, computers. And the process is that all of this data is wiped before selling them off. However, in this instance, Computing Magazine was able to use some forensic tools and they recovered 22,000 deleted files. And there have been so many other cases in which, you know, organizations or people were able to use these tools. They were able to recover things like credit card information, you know, medical histories and all kinds of information. So just thinking that, you know, if you delete a file or do a quick format of the hard disk and that's good, actually that's not good enough. Now, let's see what you can do. 
what are some of the precautions that you can take to make sure that your data is properly sanitized and you know there's no issue of data remnants now ultimately the best way which provides 100 percent guarantee is to physically destroy the hard disk through shredding incineration or maybe even drilling holes in them now i understand as an end user you know this is often not feasible for all of us but you know rest assured that companies who are very serious about these kind of issues about data remnants who are you know conscious of about the security and privacy of the data they do have built-in processes to make sure that you know any of the hard disks that they want to discard or you know maybe reuse they are either destroyed or you know uh, they undergo certain intensive cleaning process now you know obviously if physically destroying the hard disk is not feasible then you can use at least professional tools like dban or hdd low level formatting now these tools do a deeper formatting and they fill the hard disks with zeros and ones and you know so they reduce the probability of data being recovered another very interesting technique which you can use is to perform multiple iterations of formatting and that filling the hard disk with junk data so the basic idea is you go ahead and you format your hard disk then you fill it with for example you have a big movie file and you copy it again and again and you fill the hard disk and you f do the formatting again and then you repeat the process now this is going to reduce the probability of data recovery uh, down the road however please uh, you know understand that it's just a game of probability you're reducing the probability that you know someone would be able to recover your data ultimately if you want 100 percent guarantee the only way is to physically destroy the hard disk so you know just to keep in mind you know um, whenever you have these types of assets or you know hard disk drives laptops cell phones before you go ahead and just wipe them and format them and discard them in uh, you know dumpsters or sell them off uh, there are these kind of issues which you should definitely keep in mind so with that we conclude our lecture i'll see you in the next one